Congregation, it is a privilege for us to worship our God again this afternoon. Before we begin our worship service, Council has the following announcements. Consistory hopes to meet the Lord willing tomorrow evening at 7.30 in this church building. Due to the retirement from office of brothers Q. Hartorn, F. Miedema, B. Weringa, R. Devink, and A. Steinbergen, the congregation is requested to suggest names of brothers who would be suitable for the office of elder or deacon by April the 2nd. Nominations from the congregation must be accompanied with evidence that the elements of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 3 have been seriously considered. This includes specific reasons why a brother is eligible for office it should include evidence that the brother is known to those sending in the nomination. Those are the announcements. Let's rise for worship. Congregation of the Lord, from where does your help come from? Receive the Lord's greeting, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the from earth. Amen. Let's respond to this greeting by singing from Psalm 147, stanzas 1 and 2. Together also with the Church of all times and places, confess our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed by singing hymn one.
Let's together come before God in prayer. Almighty God and gracious Father in heaven, we come before your holy throne of grace. O Lord, to whom, who else would we go? You are the God of life, and you are the God who redeems life. And you have given us life, not only by making us, but also by recreating us in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this day, which you give us and which we can enjoy. We thank you especially that we may enjoy you and have joy in knowing you and your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that we may know that you are a God who does not change and that your promises endure forever. And Lord, as we gather together, we are mindful of how weak we are and how weak our faith is. We know how easily we are distracted by sin. Sometimes it doesn't take very much. For the enemy, he doesn't even have to push very hard, and we fall into sin. We realize how vulnerable we are and how much we need to keep looking to you. And so we pray that you would bless our worship and our fellowship. May it be honoring to your holy name. May it serve to keep us planted firmly in the truth of your word and in the riches of the gospel promises so that we would all continue to be living members of your congregation and grow in faith and in love towards you and to one another. We pray that in our union with Christ we would increasingly become people who bear much fruit. And may the fruits of the Spirit be ours in rich measure, O Lord. Help us to walk in love, in joy, and in peace, and goodness, and kindness, and gentleness, and patience, and self-control. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's turn now to Psalm 34. Psalm 34, stanzas 2 and 4. I invite you to take your Bibles now and turn with me to our scripture reading for this afternoon, which is taken from the book of Job. We will read, first of all, from the first chapter, 
Job chapter 1 and also from chapter 38. Your liturgy says we will read from 13 through 22, but I would like to begin at the first verse of chapter 1. We'll read the whole chapter. Job chapter 1. In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands. But on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house. When suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house, it collapsed on them and they and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. And then we turn... To chapter 38 beginning at verse 1 and we will read the first 33 verses 38 beginning at verse 1 then the Lord answered Job out of the storm he said who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, This far you may come and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning 
or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of light? And where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you were already born. You have lived so many years. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed, or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no man lives, a desert with no one in it, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass? Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? when the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen? Can you bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can you loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? So far, our scripture reading the text for the sermon this afternoon is verse 1 of this chapter. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. After the proclamation of God's word, we will sing together from Psalm 131, stanzas 1, 2, and 3. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, in the book of Job we are presented with the thoughts and struggles of men who are grappling with the providence of God. At the beginning of the book we find Job, a righteous man, a man who feared and loved the Lord, not for not because God had blessed him with so many riches, but because he knew his God. He loved God for who God is. But we also see that the devil rejected this possibility. He didn't think any man could be satisfied and content in God alone. But the Lord challenged Satan in order to prove the reality of his love in the life of Job. Satan's attempts to separate Job from God's saving love failed because Job was one of God's chosen children for the sake of Christ. That's how we have to see it. We also see how Job loses everything and yet he praises God. And we know, you notice that Job's response to this extraordinary suffering is a most extraordinary response. He worships. He loses everything, and then he worships. Just think about that for a moment. Is that the first thing you would do if God took everything that you hold dear? And if only Job would have stuck to that confession, his confession, and left it at that. And if only Job's friends would have said, Job, the God who was with you your entire life Right up until now, he has not changed. He is almighty and perfect, and his care and his love for you doesn't change. Job, dear friend, stick to your confession. 
That would have been good, that would have been helpful and encouraging, but instead, his friends become stumbling blocks to this righteous man. They, they cast doubt on his faith and his trust in God. And they come up, they, they challenge Job. Job, either you're a horrible sinner and you're getting exactly what you deserve, or, or God must be unjust. What's it going to be, Job? And of course, Job does what any of us would do. He responds to the challenge. He wants to defend himself. He responds to the false accusation of his three friends, but in doing so, he falls into the trap of trying to justify himself and reason with God. And there's a warning in this for us too, congregation. When someone is suffering and begins to ask questions, we need to be careful that we don't come up with quick and handy answers. It doesn't quite work that way. We need to point people to the right direction, to God's love and care for his people in Jesus Christ. You know, it's so easy for us to get stuck into this dilemma just like Job did. This dialogue with his friends just keeps on going from bad to worse. And when Job challenges God to explain himself, he doesn't get an answer. If you jump ahead to chapter 31, for example, 35 through 37, we can read some of the last words of Job. He says there, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me as a crown. I would give him an account of all my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. And note well that, that Job still acknowledges that the Almighty is the one who has the final say, but he's demanding an answer from God. He demands to know what God has against him. He wants to see a written indictment so he can vindicate himself. Now we can probably relate to this, can't we? Job is confused and angry. He wants to know why this is happening to him. And he feels abandoned by his God. This, this man who lived so close to God is feeling alienated from God. And then comes God's answer. God is going to testify on his own behalf against the lawsuit that Job has brought against him. So Job actually finally will get what he asked for. Finally, the moment has arrived, chapter 38, verse 1. Job is going to get vindicated. Well, not quite. God answers Job, but not in the way that Job expects, not the way his friends expect either. He answers Job with his majesty. So, brothers and sisters, let's this afternoon together listen to what God has to say to Job. The theme is, the majesty of God is the answer to Job's self-justification. We will see that it is a stunning answer. Secondly, a redeeming answer. When you begin reading in chapter 38, verse 1, you are immediately struck by the, what God does not say. God doesn't say, Job, you really are a righteous man, but you had to suffer anyway, and here are the reasons. Neither does God say, Job, you are really a great sinner, and here's the list of all the things that you have done wrong, and this is why you're getting punished. God seemingly ignores the entire discussion of Job and his friends. It's as if God just brushes all those dialogues aside, all those questions, all that nonsense of human logic. 38 verse 1 tells us that God speaks out of the storm or the whirlwind, depending on your English translation. And if you look back to chapter 37 verse 22, you will notice that they already saw the storm coming. Elihu had already seen the storm approaching. God comes in majesty in the thunderstorm, and his voice overpowers everything around Job and his friends. And it's important, congregation, to note that God's answer is characterized by the form in which it is given. God is up there, and Job and his three friends are down here. And Job and his friends need to know this. 
God is not about to join them on the ash heap and take part in their dialogue. That's the first part of God's answer to Job. He is higher than we. He doesn't have to give an account. Job was completely out of line. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, Scripture tells us. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of God's law. And then out of the storm, the Lord begins to speak. That's a miracle in itself, congregation. That God would talk to a man with human speech. And what a speech! It's one of the most gripping passages in all of Scripture. A sermon on God's creation and His providence. And in this sermon, God issues a challenge to Job. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Can you just imagine Job and his friends sitting there on the ground under that storm, listening to that voice and that question? It's enough to make you cringe in fear and shame. And God didn't really come with such very kind words either, did he? No, he comes with a challenge. Who are you, Job? How do you dare to question me? I am going to question you now, Job, and you better brace yourself like a man and answer me if you can. You see, Job's sin was the same one that got the entire human race into trouble in the first place. Adam and Eve reasoned that they knew better than God. And Job had been acting just like his first parents. He wanted to know things that God had not revealed. If only he had stuck to his first confession when he worshipped God back in chapter 1. But instead he begins questioning God. Instead of submitting, he begins to rebel. Instead of praying, he begins to reason. Again, we can all empathize with Job, can't we? Our hearts naturally tend to rebel when things don't go our way when we think that God isn't really being fair in how he treats us. Is it fair that someone else is more talented than I am? Why does the struggle with sin always have to be so hard and come back every day again? Why can't God just do something about that? And why do other people just seem to get away with sinning? And perhaps most agonizing of all, why does God allow this to happen to me? We often question God just like Job did, don't we? And so this answer from God to Job is an answer that fits for all of us. And what an answer. Notice that God just comes with a list of questions. There are well over 40 questions just in chapters 38 and 39 alone. It's a cloudburst of rhetorical questions and some of them are full of irony. And Job has nowhere to go from this downpour. He's going to get soaked. And it seems as if his worst fears are coming true because back in chapter 9, verse 16 and 17, he had said, If I summoned him, that is God, and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice, for he crushes me with a tempest. But notice that God does not crush Job. He could have. He could have. But just as God came to Adam in the Garden of Eden, so he comes to Job in love and mercy. He comes to teach his child a lesson. Verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Where, Where were you there? Were you there, Job? If you're so wise, and wisdom comes with old age, doesn't it? So tell me. Who determined its measurements? Well, that's the end of the lawsuit right there already, isn't it? Now, how can Job possibly reply to that? But the Lord doesn't give him an opportunity to reply. He bombards Job with more questions. Who shut the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? And then God takes Job on on a mental trip, on a journey to the far reaches of the universe, to the depths of the sea, verse 16, to the gates of the shadow of death, verse 17, the vast expanses of the earth, the places where light and darkness reside, 
to the storehouses of the hail and the lightning, the east wind and the rain and the ice and the snow. And God puts all of this before Job. Who is able to understand how the master designer and builder put everything together? This vast and intricate universe. And yet, God is still not finished speaking. He moves Job's attention away from the earth and directs it upward to the heavens. Verses 31 to 33, he points to the constellations, Pleiades and Orion. Light years away, can you bind the chains of Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you govern the heavens, Job? For man to have any idea of God's dominion of the heavens is laughable, is it not? We have no idea how large the universe is. We can't wrap our heads around that. The constellations mentioned here in these verses are, are relatively nearby in terms of distance from the earth. Orion would be the farthest, about 1,200 light years away. You know how long a light year is? 9.5 trillion kilometers. That's the kind of yardstick we need to use to measure the universe. And it is, Orion is at a distance equal to about 1,200 of those yardsticks. And then there's constellations that are 30 million light years away. Might as well not even try wrap your head around those numbers. And the vast expanse of the universe is filled with stars and constellations, trillions and trillions of them. And the Bible says God knows them all by name. And there's a little children's song that says the Lord has the whole world in his hands. It's just that simple. You can almost hear God gently laughing at Job, can't you? Throughout all these questions. Not a sarcastic, mean kind of laugh, but a fatherly, loving sort of laugh. Job, my child, what do you think you're doing? What are you saying, Job? Why are you challenging me? Don't you know who I am? I am the God who created you. The God who created this vast expanse. I am the sovereign Lord of the universe. And if you can't control the sea and the wind and the stars and the rain, and you can't hold Orion in its place, how can you approach me? This was the answer of God to Job's complaint. No more and no less than a description of creation and God's providential care over creation. That is a stunning answer to Job's complaint. Job's complaint was about the way in which God governs man, and God's answer is to point out how he governs the trees and the animals and the stars. The Lord does not have to give an account of himself in a human way, brothers and sisters, but he does it in a divine way. And then when Job finally emerges from his foolishness, he has nothing to say. Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer. Twice, but I will proceed no further. Chapter 40, verse 4 and 5. And that still isn't enough. God continued to humble Job in chapter 40. Job had to listen a little longer yet before he comes to the point where God is leading him. He says to Job, dress for action like a man, I will question you. You make it known to me. He issues Job another challenge. Why don't you take God's place for a moment, Job? You adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. You clothe yourself with glory and splendor. And then go. You go destroy the wicked if you can. Verse 11. Pour out the overflowings of your anger. If you think God's not doing it properly, why don't you destroy the wicked? You bring them down. You hide them in the dust. You do it if you can. That's a stunning answer, isn't it, congregation? But that's the only answer that is suitable for us. This is the answer God gives to the rebellious questioning of human beings. It's not an answer that we like to hear, is it? We... We want to know the why and the how. And it's true, sometimes the Lord does give those kinds of answers. But that depends on his good pleasure. 
Think, for example, of some of the Old Testament prophets. There were times when God explained his actions in great detail, but many times his people had to be satisfied with much less. The Lord told Paul, My grace is sufficient for you. And the scriptures tell us, The righteous shall live by faith. And to live by faith is to trust in the Lord. It means that we recognize God for who he is. That is what the Lord wants us to understand. He wants us to understand, I am who I am. I am the Lord, and besides me there is no other. There is no one who can be compared with me. This is how I act. This is what I do. I am sovereign and almighty, and you may not question me. Only when we recognize this, this all-important relationship between us and God, only then can we judge God's deeds and actions in faith, in faith. And then we have to humble ourselves like Job did. In 42 verse 6, we read his final confession, Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. You see that Job has come full circle again. The man who fell to the ground in worship in chapter 1 after he was inundated by disaster, and then who challenged God because he felt abandoned, he has seen his God for who he is. And so he repents from his presumptuous attitude and he falls down in worship. And this is the point to which God wanted to bring Job. That's where Job had to be brought. That's where God wanted Job to come, to the point where he recognized and rejoiced in God his Creator, and His Redeemer. And so we also see that this answer is a redeeming answer. And if it really comes down to a congregation, Job had been longing for this answer. All along, chapter 19, Job cried out in that chapter, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last He will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart yearns within me, my heart faints within me. Job longed for the day when he would come face to face with his Redeemer. And in these chapters he meets him. When Job says in 42 verse 5, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. He's not speaking of his physical eyes. He only heard God speaking out of the storm. God had not yet come in the flesh, so Job could not see him and live. But with the eyes of faith, he has come to a further understanding of who his God is. Job's life had become shipwrecked. And he felt abandoned by God. But he clung to his faith in the living God, whom he earlier called his Redeemer. And a Redeemer congregation is someone who can restore a broken relationship. And by speaking to Job out of the storm, God restored his relationship with his child, the child who had challenged him and, and who had lost sight of who his God is. You know, we said earlier, it was a miracle that God spoke to Job in human language, but an even greater miracle is the fact that God spoke to Job at all. God could have destroyed Job and his friends, but in his grace, he answered Job's lawsuit. And no doubt, Job's friends were pretty happy about that, that God was humbling Job, making him bow in the dust. And they probably thought that's what Job deserved. But you can be sure that Satan was not happy about this. Because when God answered Job out of the whirlwind, then Satan knew absolutely that he had lost the challenge that he threw at God back in chapter 1. Because when God comes in glory and makes himself known to sinful man, then he shows he still wants to be involved with us. And this is Satan's defeat. For Job recognized the coming of the Lord in majesty and glory as God coming in grace and mercy and with salvation. And in God's revelation to Job, we see the truth and reality of Jesus Christ. God's revelation to Job 
was part of his continued revelation to all of his people. And when God spoke to Job out of the whirlwind, he revealed the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That revelation had begun already in paradise when Adam fled trembling from, from God in the garden and he hid himself. Already then God had promised his son and in the whirlwind he confirmed that God comes to man because God keeps his promises. That's why he saves his children. That's why he came to Job in grace and mercy. He came because of Christ, whom Job had not yet seen, but who has come in the flesh and has died and risen again. Without Christ, congregation, God's providence would be a terrifying thing. Outside of Christ, God's answer from the whirlwind would have swept Job away in a, in a deluge. Job's sinful words toward God prove then how necessary the coming of Christ was. But God's gracious answer shows also how the reality of Christ's coming allows Job to turn to God and live. And Job did live. He repented. He confessed his sin and his guilt. He once again became the man who feared and loved the Lord for who he is. Brothers and sisters, do you too love the Lord for who he is? Do you trust his providential care for you because he has shown you who he is in Jesus Christ? All too often we take God's providential care as a, a kind of caring for everyone. God gives us all what we need like a good-natured grandfather and when we think of God doing what is best for us, we would also like to have a little bit to say about what is best for us. No? And secretly, way down in the depths of our conscience, there is that little voice that tries to say that if I had something to say about it, it would go differently, perhaps even better. If only we had a little bit to say because God's providence we think sometimes falls short here or there or could be improved here or there. But God is not our agent and he is not our assistant and his providential care does not come to us in a grandfatherly kind of way that suits our purposes and our desires and our needs and notions and dreams. God's providence and care comes in majesty and glory and power and sovereign might. And note well that his love and grace and mercy do not come through his providence. God did not answer Job through his providence but through his glory and his majesty. And the Lord does not answer our greatest needs, our greatest need, singular, with providence. His providence applies to all people, even to the animals and to the stars. But when God answers his children, when he answers our need, our greatest need, he answers with himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. When God spoke to Job, he did not speak in his providence, but in his majesty. And when God came to us in Jesus Christ, he did not come to us in his providence, but in his majesty. He came himself. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, the Apostle John writes. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The manner of God's answer to Job proved that he wanted to be involved in Job's life. And the manner of God's coming to earth in Jesus Christ proves that he wants to be involved in the life of his children, all those who believe in him. And so let each, of one, each one of us turn to God, who is so gracious and willing to give himself to us. Let us turn to him and repent in dust and ashes because of our many sins. 
But let's also remember we have a glorious and majestic and almighty God whom we can trust and lean on. He proved it to Job by speaking out of the storm. And he has proven it to us by speaking to us in his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Together, come before God in thanksgiving prayer. Almighty, sovereign God, creator, redeemer, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in majesty and glory. And we thank you that your care for us comes to us through Jesus Christ and through his redemptive work. Lord, we know that apart from him we would have to fear your wrath and your justice. But we know that in him your wrath and justice has been satisfied and we no longer need to fear your wrath if we believe and trust in you. We thank you for this good news. We thank you that we may know that everything that happens to us in this life comes through your fatherly care and that everything that happens in this life to those who believe in you happens because you are a loving father who lovingly disciplines his children, who wants to teach his children, who wants to bring us closer to you. Father, we pray then that you would be near to us as you were near to Job. Help us in our struggles. We all have struggles and burdens, whether they are physical or mental or emotional. Father, help us to lay them all before you and to be content, not to, not to fight your care over us. Help us to trust in you, O oh Lord. Also in our struggle against sin. That's a struggle that continues every day. And it comes back at us every day again. Father, strengthen us through your Holy Spirit so that we might live as your children and help us to submit to you and to your Holy Word in every aspect of life, in our, in our marriages, in the way we parent our children, in the way we respect our parents and our teachers and others in authority over, you, over us. 
in the way that we treat each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. May the fact that you have redeemed us be evident in how we treat others. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to humbly accept all things that you send us to be patient in adversity and thankful in prosperity for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has shown us what it means that you give yourself to your children. And Father, we pray that as we go from here, you would give us all that we need in the coming week. Help us to be faithful in our task, whatever you have given us to do. Will you keep sin and evil far from us, protect us from serious harm and danger, above all from temptation? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You now have an opportunity to worship and thank the Lord with your gifts. Today the offerings are for the Middle East Reformed Fellowship. We will sing afterwards from hymn 81, all seven stanzas.
Congregation, receive the Lord's blessing and go in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.